Element if you are new. There are Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. If you don't own one, you can have one. If you forgot one, you can use one. We have new sermon notes on the communion tables throughout the room. They are half sheets for the summer. And I already had someone say to me, how am I going to get all my notes on? And I'm like, I was like, you take notes? So... <laughs> So I'm very excited. So I'm notes. Anyway, uh, on the front side, you're going to get a very, very, very short recap of what we will talk about today. On the back side, you get just a few questions that you can reflect upon, talk to friends, family, if you're in your gospel community, talk to a gospel community about to begin to go deeper. Underneath that, you get a tiny little place for notes. Uh, and then you get the verses we're covering on the bottom of that. If you have a smart device, you can download an app. It is called Uversion. Once you download it, it just says Bible. Click on More and then Events in Uversion. We will come up by GPS in your smart device, and you'll get sermon notes, verses, questions, announcements, all that goes with today's message with the brand new series. My name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors at Element. Why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? This is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, and it says, The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Let's pray. Father, today we ask that you would teach us what it means to be those who truly understand the gospel, the good news, not just that we can regurgitate it, not just that we can understand a concept, but that it would come into our lives in a way that it changes how we live, how we see everything, that the good news of your rescue over us transforms our lives to reflect who you are to the world around us and to our own hearts. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, again, br brand new series. Uh, we are in the, the book of 1 Timothy. Now, I'm going to tell you how this came about. You may not care. I can make the sermon shorter if I didn't tell these stories. But anyway, the series we're starting now, we were actually going to do this series last year. But I read this book by Tim Keller called Forgive, and it was so good. I thought we all need to go through it. So we spent 11 weeks going through this Forgive book. And I took this series and I moved it to this year. Now, what's interesting is God has a way of just doing what he wants to do, right? Okay, right. God is not beholden to us. And when I have these ideas, I can tell you right now what my plan is, what we're going to teach for probably the next three years. Not that I have written that, but I have a trajectory of where I think God is calling us to go as a church, the things that he wants us to walk through. So I could tell you that. And I had this again last year. Now, the way God worked it out is he moves it to this year in this place where he just came out of the book of Ephesians. Guess where Timothy is at when Paul writes this letter? Ephesus. He is in Ephesus. And so if Paul is taking all the things he's now talked about in this letter in the book of Ephesians, and now he's saying, Timothy, you need to defend and speak about this doctrine that is here. You need to make sure people understand what this is because there's a lot of wonky things going on. And so this is we, where we're at. The gospel that Paul has talked about the last 24 weeks, defending it because it is really under attack in the city of Ephesus. Now, so we're going to talk about this thing called doctrine. And when people hear the word doctrine, it sounds kind of scary, like you're going to go to school and there's going to be a test. There's no test. Really, the word doctrine simply means a position that is advocated or taught. That's what it means. And when you see this, there is a doctrine no matter where you go. If you're part of a club, that club has a doctrine. A political party has a doctrine. You and your friends hanging out, playing video games, you have a doctrine. What you say, what you don't say, how you help, how you revive. Everybody has this idea of a doctrine. And so when we come to Christianity and the scriptures and we refer to doctrine, it is specifically the truth that is laid down in the scriptures. And it is so important for us to understand what this means. Because what we believe will ultimately come out in how we view God and then how we begin to live. And so today, I'm going to give you an overview of kind of where we're going in 1 Timothy. Uh, there are some specifics throughout the book, but not too many. And we're going to do, as I said, this high-level view. That's kind of what our graphic is, the high-level view. You're driving, you just see the road, but a high-level view, you can see the roads and where they're going. This is a high-level view, and it's going to be 10 weeks. Now, that should shock you because the book of Galatians last year, we went through it, six chapters, 26 weeks, half a year. The book of Ephesians, six chapters, 24 weeks, nearly half a year. First Timothy, six chapters, 10 weeks. You're welcome, all right? <laughs> 
You're going to see what it's like for me to blaze through a book. And you're still going to think it's probably too slow. But anyway, here's the big idea. Doctrine matters. What we believe matters. Knowing correct doctrine is going to help us to defend what the gospel truly is. You see, God is connected to his church, to his people, like a great artist is connected to their art. And the church, not the building, but the people themselves, how we are supposed to function correctly, not always how we do, but how we're supposed to function correctly. When we do that, God is seen in the world. As a matter of fact, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 10, we are called God. God's workmanship in the world. That word workmanship is the word poem, poema. And so we are God's artistry to the world. Now there's this old saying called the proof is in the pudding. Don't know if you heard about that. Don't know if you like pudding, but this goes back to the 14th century when pudding was not sweet. Uh, it's not like a jello pudding pops and you know, you can't even say the guy who used to be the spokesman for him anymore. But anyway, uh, it's, it now, you know, back then it was sausages. So it's not like pudding like you think. And it's not great sausage. It would be minced meats and spices and blood and cereal, not breakfast cereal, like grains. And they would mush it all together into intestines and they would boil them or steam them. And if it was done wrong, you could get sick or die. So how do you know if it was, if it was any good? You would have to eat it. Yum. That just sounds so great. The original saying was actually, the proof is in the eating of the pudding, because then you would know how good the preparer of the pudding actually was. Were they a hack or a genius? Now, we still use this word proof in sayings like, like alcohol. What's the proof? How strong is the alcohol? It relates to other things like full proof or bullet proof or proof read. God's glory is meant to be tied to the church. And so what we are living, teaching, believing, the proof is in the pudding. How we live is meant to be the eating of the pudding. And this is why it's so important to understand what the gospel truly is, to know you if you have the real thing. So we got to taste. We've got to dive in. Psalm 34 verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And so when the church, the people begin to function as God calls them to, you're going to get a clearer picture of the church maker, of the, of the pudding maker. Okay. Uh, open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1. That's on page 642 if you're going to use one of the Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. So 1 Timothy is really this charge for people to see the evidence of God in the church, in the people. We might look strange to everybody else in the world because we just live differently. It's like this. When my wife and I bought our first house, we went in and we're trying to go through this stuff. And they said, but you could afford to buy this house. And we said, well, we can't really because we take this percentage of our income off the top every month and we give it away. We're generous. And they're like, you guys are weird. Yet when we are generous, we're going to look weird to the rest of the world. If you step into a church, there are you know, GC leaders at Element, and there's pastors, and there's, and there's deacons. And when sometimes people willingly put themselves under the leadership of other people, it looks strange to the world around us. And the leaders in a church aren't meant to be like, I have power. They're there to serve the people around them so we can help people to understand the gospel better. And it just looks weird to the world around us. You would see multi-ethnic and, and multi generational generational people coming together to worship Jesus first and foremost. Why would someone in their 20s hang out with somebody in their 70s or 80s and then worship Jesus? It just looks weird to the world around us. Now, your personal experience of the church may be anything but a reflection of Jesus, but the failure of people does not mean that God failed. And so we always have to be open to what God is doing in our midst, what he's calling us into. And metaphorically, I think that God's heart breaks when churches don't reflect him. And I would encourage you not to judge the true thing simply because of your experience with the wrong thing. And I'm not saying that Element has this all together. We fail in a lot of ways. We tell you guys all the times the way we fail. Sometimes you say, stop telling us all the ways you fail. <laughs> we get that. But we want our hearts to be focused upon the person of Christ, worshiping his, at him as our divine creator because of what he did in the gospel to save us. And so today, if we want to be a people who reflect God in what we do, the church must guard the gospel, guard the doctrine, defend what the gospel really is. So this is how Paul starts. 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. That's how Paul starts. Where's our hope? 
It's in Jesus. Exactly, it's in Jesus. It's, it's not in us. He brings grace and he brings mercy and he brings peace. See how it starts? Just like that. That's where we have to start. If you're ever going to have a true doctrine centered in Christ, it's going to start with Jesus. That's where you start. Uh, Andrew Hopper once said that false teaching leads to false fruit. And I would say it leads to false pudding. I'm going to use that a lot, and you guys are going to be like, stop using the pudding metaphor. <laughs> but Paul is now, in the beginning of this, going to talk about how false teaching begins to get sown into the church. Uh, when we watch or listen to people who have terrible theology, that just doesn't, is, that's just not a reflection of our culture. That will get reflected in our churches. Do you know that of churches who claim to follow the Bible, evangelical, quote-unquote, churches, 50% of people in those churches today believe that God changes? that Jesus was only a good moral teacher and that the Bible is on par with any sacred, other sacred book in the world. And if you believe those things, I would encourage you, come to our weekender class. We walk through these things, not in a way that would ever make you feel dumb in any way, but a way to say, this is what God has revealed. This is what he teaches. We want to help you to see the truth. Paul keeps going. He's just warming up. Verse 3, he says, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. There's our word. Nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations, rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge, what's the aim? Love that issues from a pure heart, which is what God gives us, a good conscience, which we'll talk about next week, that God brings us, and a sincere faith. The faith is the word trust, sincere trusting in who God is. Every church is going to have issues. Uh, the church in Ephesus, they are no different. Uh, we saw a few of those as we walked through the book. But Timothy has a lot of issues to deal with in this city and in this church. But the most important thing that Paul says is you have to know how to people, teach people to stop teaching false doctrine. That's not you go out and you beat them up. It's know the truth so you can speak and reason and help people to understand what it is, which means there is true doctrine. It's not what I feel is true. It is what God has said is true. Now, people throughout ages have always asked skeptical questions about the early church. Did they really believe Jesus was God? Did they really believe in the resurrection or whatever? Well, they actually did. And there's an accepted, settled on theology and doctrine here. And Paul tells Timothy, what you have to do is stop the false teaching because it's going to result in bad pudding. I want to work it in, and at one point you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's nice, I get it. Okay, so Paul's going to end 1 Timothy with doctrine as well. He's going to end the whole thing. Chapter 6, verse 20, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you, that's salvation and truth. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it some have swerved from the faith. In the middle of it, chapter 4, verse 6, he will also talk about doctrine. I almost called this series the doctrine sandwich, but then our graphic would not have been as cool. You'd be like a, like a sandwich and look great. But you have doctrine at the beginning, doctrine at the end, doctrine at the middle. This is what the whole book is about. We are supposed to be a people who see the fruit in our lives that comes out of a work of what God is doing. It's not legalism. It is God doing a work and changing our hearts. And there are many people today who will claim the name Jesus. I am sure you have seen them in different places. And yet the fruit, the, the pudding in their lives shows a completely different story. When a church starts to look a little wonky, what you need to do is what's being taught and who's the person teaching it? You know, wh what is happening there? If, if we sow the false idea that you better be good or God's going to get you, like it's Santa Claus theology, he sees you when you're sleeping, knows when you're awake, being bad or good, so you better be good for goodness sake. Why, why do we scare little kids like this? You know, Santa's a big meanie in a giant red suit. He's going to come down that chimney and not give you anything. Eat your cookies and leave. You better be good. It's, that, that's not who God is. Oh, you have to clean up your life to make yourself acceptable to God. That is called works based righteousness. And if you sow that, you're going to reap fear, and it may look like obedience for a little bit, but it's not. People are going to be disillusioned. They're going to feel like, I can never love God the way he is loved me. I can never measure up because 
we can't. This is why God gives us His righteousness. If a church says a doctrine that says the Bible is not God's revealed word, it's subordinate to whatever our culture wants to do today, whether it's sexual ethics or morality, we say, oh, the Bible's outdated, people are going to have no strong backbone. And anything that comes along in our culture is going to blow us with the winds of the change that are there. Whenever people automatically think whatever the culture teaches has to be right, because that's how people feel at a given time, that's reaped by poor doctrine. If you teach that God is too nice to tell anybody no, that God's just like the big sky fairy that says, yeah, whatever you want to do, it makes you feel good, do it. I'm right there with you. You want the meth? Take the meth. You know, it's, it's like, I'm your buddy. No, no. You have to understand that God is, is not like that. If you tell people that, you're going to raise a generation of people who are simply sentimental but never know true love because they're going to define love on their own terms rather than in how God has defined love. It may look like love. You may say it's love, but it's not because you can't have love without truth. You can't. So we must pour our lives into what the scriptures have shown. The Bible is true. God is triune. The gospel is Christ's work to save us. When you go downstream from bad teaching, you're going to get bad fruit. First Timothy, as I said, I don't think it gets into the weeds. Some commentators think it does. But I think Paul, through the book, is a little bit general in a lot of things. Because we may call it one thing here, and it may still be the same thing over here, but they may call it something different. And so Paul is just trying to help us to understand these larger issues. And what you'll see is heresy is always going to come in and try and tear down the church. So Paul says, charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. We were talking about this this week, and this is like the Christian way to throw shade. You know who they are, certain persons. Now, Paul will actually say who they are at the end of this chapter. You'll see that next week. He says, charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God that is by faith. So Paul talks about two things that bring bad pudding into the church that keep moving us away from who God calls us to be. The first thing is this, devotion to what is wrong. Devotion to what is wrong. Rather than being devoted to the very clear portions of Scripture, we get focused on the periphery. Maybe something that was said over here or something that's not even said, but we just think it's implied, and we run with these things. Maybe they're unknowable or maybe they're false. So there's folklore that has crept into the church, and Paul calls it myths and endless genealogies. If you went through the book of Ephesians with us, you know some of these things that were there we talked about. But what is a myth? A myth is something that starts in truth, and ends in a lie. Where it starts in the truth, it's like, oh yeah, and you get to the end of that, and you're like, wait, wait, that, that's not right. Now, I'm not trying to badmouth any other church or pastors or things like that, but I have seen people say and teach the most bizarre things in the world. I was talking to this one pastor, and he said that God has led him to study angels. My job is to study angels. And I thought, why don't you study the life of Christ, like what Jesus did? It's just really weird. His whole life was focused on this. Another guy told me that an angel's wingspan is as big as a Santa Maria Valley. It's nowhere in the Bible. Okay, Bible doesn't talk about this. And I'm like, hope a feather doesn't fall off and hit my car, because that would just destroy my car. I've had people tell me, if you have enough faith and element, you have enough faith, God has to show up bodily at your gathering, like we're Mormons, and God's going to show up like a Puritan white dude or something. Hey, we have enough faith. Here comes God. He's got to show up. If we all pray a certain prayer, all of us together for the next half hour, God has to do what we say. God does not have to do what you say. Okay? He does. He does not have to do what you say. Uh, I've read books by people who say we're going to go to the, these graveyards and we're going to get the anointing of the bones from these people onto our lives. Oh, my goodness. Guys, look. God has laid out some very specific things in the scriptures that we trust. There are other things in the Bible that seem a little bit vague. And we have to understand, we look at the portions that are clearly seen. God is not obligated to us in any other way than how he obligated himself to us in the gospel. We always seem to want to run something to something fantastical because for some reason we don't want to just live our lives in the ordinary of the everyday. And yet that's how we live our lives. And the majority of scripture teaches us how to live our lives in the ordinary everyday. 
If I go to a church or I watch online, maybe on vacation or whatever, I try not to be critical. But what I do is I listen. I'm attentive to, is this the gospel? Do they know the gospel? Because there's a lot of people who throw out the word gospel and really have no idea what it means. When you go to a church, you naturally assume that Jesus is going to be lifted up and the gospel is going to be spoken. But that's not always true. See, the gospel is not the Bible though it is in the Bible. The gospel is not laws. The gospel is not personal righteousness. It is specifically the announcement of what Jesus did for us at the cross and the resurrection. And when some weirdo shows up to Element, it has happened more than once, and they have said, God told me I'm supposed to preach at your church. And I'm like, God didn't tell me nothing. <laughs> and it's... And it, it, it has happened, and it's self-important. So I really don't want to, but, you know, God has call, called me to do this. I usually ask two questions. Not that I would let them, but I, I usually ask two questions. I say, what is the gospel, and who is Jesus? And they're usually wrong on one of those, most likely both, <laughs> when they give me the answer. But this is the myth. Starts in the truth, Jesus. It ends in a lie. It's all about me. It's all about me. Uh, there's this big one a while ago. It's still big today, too, that Jesus was a real person. He's a good teacher killed by the Romans on a cross, but he did not resurrect. That is all made up. And the resurrection is just spiritual for my life. What, what, what does it mean for me? See, it starts in the truth, ends in a lie. Do you know the apostle Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. The resurrection is central to the gospel announcement. So it must be central in how we live. And so often we will play around with cultural ideas, never spending a whole lot of time thinking about what it actually means. Looking at the things like the resurrection, which is verifiably historically true. What about these genealogies? Well, at that time, people were obsessed in the ancient world by your family heritage. And they thought certain lineages would get you a greater standing with Christ. It's Jesus died for my sins, plus my family heritage. I get a greater place in the kingdom of God. Have you seen this section of our church over here? We have a whole section. We can look at all of your ancestors. You see who you're related to. It's going to be great. There are churches today that think that your lineage, who you are, sets you apart for deeper ministry. I have seen churches where pastors have built this church or God builds the church through the person, but then they retire, they die, and they give it to one of their kids because this is I'm just passing it on. That's not how it works. And usually those kids destroy the churches. It is not by birth. It's by new birth. God leads us to himself because he is good. And Christians, for some reason, myself included, and I just point my finger at you, we're always trying to find new things for a spiritual edge. Years ago, there used to be this thing called the Bible Code. I mean, you guys heard about this. But if you do this acrostic and add up these numbers and read these verses, you get secret knowledge that not even Jesus knew. Like when he was going to return. I know it sounds funny, and yet it's so easy to subtly slide into that. Some people, I mean, people have showed up and they've wanted to do this. And I'm like, no. And they're like, no, no, it's not a myth. It really works. And I'm like, no. I mean, seriously, the, people want to say the Bible is not plain and what it means to be plain in. So you need our system in order to see what it really says. This is why I tell you, we have closed-handed issues and open-handed issues. Closed-handed issues are the ones that we will die over. Jesus was God, dies for our sins, who God is, creation, sin. We die over these things. But there are open-handed issues over here. Sure, we can talk about angels or whatever weird thing you want to talk about, but we don't make it central doctrine. This is the centrality of the gospel, what we believe. And so we can talk about free will, how much, end times, what cookie is the best. I'll tell you which one that is, right? How about this? God wants us to run with what he has shown us to be true, what we know is true and plain. And what is that? That's the gospel. He says, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart given to us, a good conscience. Again, next week you'll see how Paul talks about this, and a sincere faith. Not all the speculations and being devoted to the wrong things, because that pulls us away from God's call in our life. Right doctrine will ultimately flow down in love and truth. The second thing Paul says that kind of ruins the pudding is the denial of the truth or the wrong things. Now, I'm not going to talk about everything that Paul says here. I'm going to read through it, and you're going to be like, but what about, but what about, but what about? I don't like those words. That's okay. Next summer, you got to come back, and I will deal with some of the things in this passage specifically, but we're doing an overview, so here we go. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting verse 6. Certain persons, by swerving from these, what are these? 
pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or about the or things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully or correctly, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and the disobedient. This is what the law is for. It's not there to make you holy. For the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. What Paul is saying is you have people, they are misrepresenting the reason God gave the law, and then they trumpet their misrepresentation as, if you just did X, Y, and Z, you will be okay. If you deny yourselves these sinful passions, you're going to be okay. And if you only have the Old Testament, you might be able to make an argument for that. But Paul tells you the law is there to show us our need for a Savior. In Romans chapter 5, verse 20, it says the law is put there to increase our trespasses, meaning that we would recognize them. We say, oh, that is not right. What the false teachers say is deny yourselves these things, devote yourselves to myths and genealogies, and you're going to be righteous before God. And Paul says, you missed the entire point of the law. You missed the point. The law is meant to help us understand the wickedness of our own hearts, where we're in rebellion against God. It's meant to be like an x-ray. A few years ago, I have this laminate flooring. I'm putting it down in this corner, and I can't get this piece. So if you know me, I go get a mallet. And I'm like, I'm going to put this down. And so I go over, and I set it like this, and I take my mallet, and I go right on my finger. Again, if you know me, this is normal, right? This is my life. Uh, my, it, it, never mind. No, sorry, I'm not going to tell. Anyway, but anyway, and, and I knew it was broken because it was flat and purple. And I said, what do I do? So I go and get an x-ray. You know what the x-ray showed? I shattered my finger. It just showed what I knew was true. That's what the law does. The law is there to expose what we know is already true. We have rebelled against God. This is why people are like, I don't like the Bible. Hey, we know what's true, right? And the doctrine is really good for this. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Paul says this. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Paul says... Legalism is demonic. How about that? That's kind of crazy. Many false teachers, they look very devoted. If you've seen them, they're very pious. Oh, they don't eat X, Y, and Z. They must be really holy. They don't get married. They must be really, they don't even let other people get married. Wow, they must be super holy. No, what they're doing is saying, Jesus, your blood wasn't sufficient. And what I have to do is deny myself these things to be acceptable and holy. Guys, salvation is not the gospel plus myths. It is not the gospel plus your genealogies. It's not the gospel plus laws. And Paul will not spend a whole lot of time talking about the details of works righteousness, but the effects of what come out of it. The effects of false teaching always undermine the gospel. Always. Always. Jesus plus anything is not the gospel. Jesus plus your good works. It's not the gospel. Jesus plus your genealogy is not the gospel. Jesus plus your weird study of angels and prayer and worship rituals is not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus alone is sufficient, period. What's the gospel? You and I, in our sin, we have separated ourselves from God because we have run away from him. We've rebelled. We put ourselves in his place thinking we know how to do life better than him. And the second we sin, it's over. Because God is a holy, righteous, eternal God. But God, in his infinite mercy, sends Christ for us. Jesus lives the perfect life that we never could have lived. He substitutes himself in our place. He goes to the cross as our sacrifice. He takes our death because that's the penalty for sin. And he exchanges our death for his life, our sin for his righteousness. He then rises from the dead as the first fruits of a promised, resurrected, renewed community of a people who will worship God and him alone. And we spread this message. You can be free. Your sins do not have to determine the rest of your life. You can be defined by what Christ himself alone has done. 
You do not have to be defined by your past, what you have done, what other people have done to you. And in 1 Timothy, Paul is trying to get us to see that any time we walk beyond the need to understand the simplicity of the gospel, we're going to jump headlong into false faith. That doesn't mean we can't spend our lives studying deep and full and rich theology, and we should. But we must always, always come back to center ourselves on the gospel because that's where the proof is going to be in the pudding. And look, I know sometimes element fails. You guys love to point it out to me all the time where we have issues, we will still fall short. But our aim is really to be a community that understands we are redeemed by the God of the universe. And I would love for every single one of us to know what the gospel is, not just to regurgitate the words, but to know it and how it speaks to every part of our life. When you are feeling defeated, guess what? Jesus was defeated for you. And so you can trust in him. When, when you fail, guess what? Jesus took that upon himself. And you can trust his forgiveness of you. When somebody else hurts or offends you, Jesus died for their sins. And so you don't have the need to crucify them and hold that grudge every day of your life. You can actually be free. I like all of us to be able to understand the gospel so much that when something false is there, it instantly stands out. Not that you run around, you're the doctrine police like the Pharisees, but that we be a people who understand that our lives are marked by love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. That we'd focus on what is true and not the counterfeit. I think that enables us to recognize error. It, when people want to see what false money is, they don't spend all their time studying false money. They study the real thing, so the false thing just becomes so, it's like, what? It doesn't feel right. It doesn't look right. It just stands out. Art critics do this too. They can see a fake and sometimes not even know why, except they know the real thing so well. How do we become familiar with the truth? I'll give you three things really quick. First is this, sit under gospel-centered preaching and teaching. Sit underneath it. There are great preachers out there. I do not claim to be one of them. Okay, there are great ones out there. I, what I want to do is reinforce to you every week what the gospel is. Hopefully, at least 52 weeks of a year, you will get something that brings you back to the Word of God and the Scriptures. And if you miss it, watch it podcast it, listen to it. If you've got a problem with something, send a question and ask it. We are not above you asking us questions. Is individual Bible reading more important than that? Don't answer it yet. I don't think so. I don't. Our GC had this talk about this last week just, just a little bit, that I don't think individual Bible reading is more important than hearing the Word of God taught, Word of God taught and then getting together with other people and talking about it. I have known some people said, well, I'm not going to go to church. I'm just going to read the Bible. And they, they don't live a life that is connected to other believers. Do you understand that this whole idea of this individual thing, that, that's a modern invention. That's not in the scriptures. What we want to do is be a people who hear the word of, good, word of God taught and get together. 1,500 years, the church didn't have a Bible in their homes. There wasn't a printing press. But yet you see this deep, rich theology in people because they got together, heard the word of God taught, and then they discussed it. Now, as one of my friends said this week, all I took away is I don't have to read the Bible. That's not what I'm saying because number two is read your Bible, okay? It's a very close number two, all right? I know I said it's not the most important, but it is important. I, I don't always think that this one-year Bible reading plan, I'm going to read through the Bible in one year is great because all you're doing is getting through it. I think it matters how much gets into you, not how much you get through, and so you read something, and you think about it, and you meditate on it. Christian meditation is not emptying your mind. It's filling your mind with the Word of God. And so we fill our minds, and we think about it, and we pray through it. We ask God to teach us. And if you don't know how to read the Bible, we'll give you some help. We'll give you a study Bible. We'll lead you to a commentary, something that works. And so as you read through the Bible, think. Read a psalm, a proverb, a gospel account. Everything is either going to be an explanation, an illustration, or an application. And so you read, what, is, what does this mean as I go through it? How can I talk to people to make sure I'm not wonky about what the gospel is and so I can understand what this said? It's all important. Third thing is this. Look for other resources for your season of life. And this is a distance third. And not everything out there that has a label slapped on it, like if there's a Christian bookstore, not everything in there is going to be good. All right. I love podcasts. I love books. I love YouTube. But some books are just better than others. And so I would say if Element is not your church 
at your church, if they teach the gospel, then listen to your pastor. Talk to your community group. Read your Bible. Pray with one another. And then interact in such a way that we can grow deeper in our understanding of the gospel. If you're at Element and you read something and you have a question, I guarantee the people around you at Element would rather have you go to them with questions. Even if they can't answer it, they'll send you to somebody who maybe can rather than have you go to Wikipedia. Let's figure this out together. And so when you start in 1 Timothy, ask, what if we devoted ourselves to be a people who defended the gospel? right? A people who understood and wanted to ha be in a place with gospel-centered preaching and teaching, reading our Bibles, and ingesting the right resources. Would our relationship with God and others grow? Of course it would. Of course it would. And so let's be honest. Many of the times in our lives where we have run towards bad doctrine, it's not something to be embarrassed of. We've all stepped into these places where we believe the wrong things. The exciting part is when you finally see the truth. And you're like, oh yeah, there is that wrong thing that I used to believe, but God led me to the truth. And not in a way where I feel horrible. He's like, I want to show you the truth because I want you to live in grace and new life. Let's be a people who understand what the gospel is. So instead of being swayed by our culture, we would take the gospel into our culture and begin to make a difference. This is why we want to be a people who learn and live in defending what the gospel is, reasoning through it, not wanting to string people up who don't agree with us, but know enough to reason through their arguments to show them what the truth actually is. Why? Because that's what God did with us. He drew us to himself. He took our sins upon himself in grace, and he leads us to understand what the truth truly is. So we get to be a people who know him and walk with him. It is such grace in how God draws us to himself. And what we want to do is Speak about this. Sing songs that reflect upon God's goodness and grace. Do rituals even that remind us of this, but none of our rituals are what save us. Like we do communion every week. Communion is something Jesus says, do this in remembrance of who I am, remembrance of what I did for you. And so when we gather every week, we give you this opportunity where you break a cracker that reminds us of Christ's body that was broken for us, and you dip it in the wine of the grape juice as a reminder of his blood that was shed for you and me. The centrality of the gospel message that Jesus died our death, gives us his life, he takes our sin, he gives us his righteousness as a gift, and we trust and have faith in that, and we are brought into new life with him. And this is something we do to remind ourselves that, you know, Communion isn't magical, but it is very spiritual. It's a way to remember what God is doing and continues to do. And so we do this as something that reminds us, God, I'm going to lay my life down before you, and I'm going to trust what you have said, and I ask that you would show me whenever I move beyond what the gospel is, that you would draw me back and reveal it to me. I'm going to trust what you said in all things. If you need prayer today, maybe you haven't really known what the gospel is or the word doctrine just freaks you out or you may have any prayer requests, we'd love to pray with you. Right across the way in the lounge, you can go during music, you can go after service, but we'd love to pray with you. If you'd like to give, there's offering boxes next to all the doors. You can give online. Element does not pass an offering plate. What we want our giving to do is to be generous and sacrificial, but we don't ever want to force anybody into it. We believe it's a response. When you understand how generous God has been with you by saving you, we want to become a generous people. So that's why we give the way that we do. Uh, I would encourage you to grab just those couple questions on the back of those half sheets and talk to some other people about it. Walk through the ideas of coming back and reminding yourself what the gospel is. Maybe you disagree with me that, you know, the Bible reading is more important than gathering together and talking about these things with other people. That's okay. That's okay. We can disagree on that. It's not a salvation issue. I'm right, but no. <laughs> No, but we, we, can, we can talk through these things. This is one of the things of why it's good to be together with other believers, to grow in what we know and what we believe, and we trust as God leads us together as we pray and lift up Christ first and then pray and lift up one another to him, that we would be a people who live and walk in the truth and that we would know the gospel so well that we naturally can defend the gospel. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we ask that you would lead us into a greater understanding of who you are and what you have done, that our words, that our thoughts, that our prayers, that our songs, that our speech, that our friendships would be those that reflect the goodness of who you are and what you've done. That is so easy in our lives to get off track, to be swayed in so many places and ways. 
And I ask that you would continue to bring us back to yourself, understanding what right and true doctrine actually is, that we trust you over ourselves, that we trust you over our culture, because you are the one who made us and you're the one that knows us. You are the one who has done everything possible to bring us back to yourself in relationship. That it is not our good works that make you love us. It is not our good works that make us righteous before you. It is what you have done by a work that you yourself accomplished in our stead. And I ask that we would be so enamored by your glory and your goodness that we couldn't help but speak about it. And when wrong doctrine pops up its head, that we would be willing to engage in a way that tries to steer that untruth back to the truth in ways that lifts you up. And so I ask that as we begin to walk through this short series in 1 Timothy, you would take all that we've kind of walked through in the book of Ephesians and continue to take this deep understanding of the gospel and move it in our lives as we walk through each of these places where we defend the gospel, where we celebrate the gospel, where we pray for the forward proclamation of the gospel. Because it's what you have done to rescue and save. And through it all, we ask that you would be glorified in it all. And we ask this in your son's good name. Amen.